Hi everybody, this is Noelle from Petites and we are at our Oakwood Village store and we are doing a plant spotlight on hummingbird mint or its botanical name. Everybody says it differently, but I'm gonna say it's called Agastaki or Agastashi and I've heard it a dozen different pronunciations. So anyway, if you say Agastaki, we'll know what you're talking about. Or if you say hummingbird mint, we'll know what you're talking about. Some people call it false isop. Some people call it anise isop. Whatever, we'll figure it out for you. Okay, so lots of names with this one. But what's cool about this plant, folks, is it is part of the mint family. It's one of those beautiful perennial blooming mints. And so we enjoy it in the garden, especially for the pollinators, and especially because it is resistant to wildlife browsing. So anyway, let's talk about how you can be successful with Agastaki. So to start out with, full sun conditions is where it grows best. So that's that six or more hours of direct sunlight in the area. If, however, you end up finding out that your area is partially shady, so four to six hours of sunlight, dappled through the day, what have you, no problem, it will continue to grow. Will the flowering be as nice? Mm, there's a possibility it won't bloom as well, but it still should bloom for you and still perform very, very well. Other thing that we look for is soil because it's in the mint family, it's really not too picky. And I do have to say it's fairly well behaved as far as clump growing. Um, it does have a rhizomatous root system, so don't get me wrong, it's gonna continue to spread. Um, but very, very similar to your bee balms and your cat mints, you're gonna have some clumps. You might find that they're spreading into a different area. You will have no problem just digging and removing that and moving it to another area, potting it up, giving it to a friend or family member, no problem whatsoever. So they're very, very easy. Soil-wise, again, because of that mint family uh, background, they can tolerate clay soil. We'd still like you to try to amend that soil with some organic matter, of course. Try to get it better draining. They can tolerate uh, some drier conditions. They can tolerate slight moist conditions, okay? So just keep that in mind pretty non-fussy with the soil. Um, second, or third thing, sorry, is watering. And we always talk about watering um, your new plants, especially with perennials. You, you really need to watch that watering until they get established. And so with this plant, um, we are looking at one inch of water, one time per week, slow and deep waterings. I always say, if you have a half inch of rainfall that week, you only have to supplement with a half inch of irrigation to make up for that one inch. Now, um, once this plant gets established, like many perennials, sun perennials, they really do quite nicely with whatever Mother Nature is providing them. So don't feel like you have to continually water this plant. You don't. And it should root fairly quickly. So within that first growing season, watch your irrigation. And then after that first growing season, meh. I don't think you'll have to worry about it too much unless we get into a really, really dry, dry period, okay? And that's another nice thing is they're, they're very good as far as that heat and drought tolerance as well. Okay, so that's a good thing to know. Fertilizer wise, with perennials, it's the standard feeding and Angelo talks about this all the time. You're feeding perennials twice a growing season, once in the spring with plant tone and iron tone, and then once midsummer with osmocote. Angelo firmly feels that that feeding with osmocote midsummer is just gonna keep on pushing them into flowering stage, keep them very, very active, vegetatively growing into the late season. So that's why he recommends osmocote for that kind of second midsummer feeding, okay? Now, with Agasaki, there's so many attributes to this plant. Again, mint family. The foliage is extremely aromatic. It has a lovely smell. Some of the varieties of this plant smell a little bit more like licorice than others. Some smell a little bit more minty than others. It really just depends on the variety that you prefer to grow, okay? Um, with that fragrance, of course, comes that resistance 
to deer browsing and also rabbit browsing, okay? So again, mints are always gonna equal really, really good growing in our gardens for us. Don't have to do much more for them there. Pollinator wise, it is attracting loads of pollinators. And behind me, there are bumblebees, there are sweat bees, there are honeybees. So far, that's what I've seen on these plants. They absolutely enjoy them. Uh, some of the flowers are a little bit longer, tubular flowers. And so you will see hummingbirds come over here. You will see butterflies by these plants. They are a great pollinator attractant and very rich in nectar, okay? So good supply of nectar here, that's always great. Another thing about we, that we love about them is that they are very long blooming. For a perennial in this area, some perennials are a little bit shorter, some definitely longer, um, some we need to cut back a little bit more often to get them to continue to bloom for us. With Agastache, you usually have a good long blooming period, usually mid-June, into typically August and you can deadhead and cut them back so they will produce more spikes, terminal spikes of flowers. So it's just, again, great plant, okay? Um, I think that's good for attributes. We kind of touched on, you know, for the most part, heat tolerant, drought tolerant, once established, um, fragrant, great deer resistance and so forth. Okay, so with the families here, there's a couple different varieties that I wanted you to be aware of. Newer on the market here are these two proven winner varieties. These are meant to be, B-E-E -E, series. The one is called Queen Nectarine. You can tell she's pretty tall in the garden. And, and I should say, Agasaki can grow anywhere from about a foot to a foot and a half all the way up to four. So there are varieties that will vary in height. So again, look at your tags, make sure you know what you're bringing home with you. Uh, Queen Nectarine, definitely a three foot variety, no problem whatsoever. Beautiful sort of peachy tubular flowers, but at the inside of this flower, that it's like a mauve um, calyx. It's really, really gorgeous, very, very showy. Uh, I wanted to tell you that these meant to be varieties are for zone six, which technically Northeast Ohio were, were there, but sometimes if you want to be safe, 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 and, sh and sure, make sure that you're mulching these at the end of the season. And I'm talking late fall, you know, everything's kind of died back, but make sure that you're mulching the base just so you're protecting that crown over winter. That's gonna be really, really helpful, okay? Uh, the next one here is Royal Raspberry. What I love about this one, not only the color, really pretty raspberry pink, but the foliage on this one is more of a blue-green Green, and it has kind of a burgundy hue to it, like a violet hue. So really pretty side by side. They really are very complementary to each other. I do have to say while I'm standing here though, the sweat bees are all about queen nectarine versus not so much with the royal raspberry right now, but it might be just because I'm closer to the royal raspberry. This next one is called Morello, and you can tell a little bit different coloring here than Royal Raspberry. Um, this one, you're gonna have sort of a burgundy pink. Um, this plant is supposed to get right around the two and a half foot mark. Um, we'll see, first year growing with Morello. Again, it's supposed to be a nice red variety, that's what they call this color, um, that is zone hardy. So again, should have some good cold hardiness, but I would recommend with these three, you know, again, try to mulch them for the winter. I think that'll help you out greatly, okay. These guys right here, I have Sunrise, and this is Salmon and Coral. You get a Salmon Bud, and or not Salmon and Coral, Salmon and Pink, I believe. And you get a Salmon Bud, and then that lighter pink flower. These are gonna be on the short side of the Agastaki. So again, about a foot and a half, they'll grow up in the landscape. Most of the Agastaki are gonna give you a nice two foot mound, maybe even a little bit bigger. So that's a really showy perennial plant in the landscape. Landscape. But Sunrise is right here. Again, winter protection, I would recommend it. Behind me, when you see the blue Agastaki, 
Those are going to be the most hardy varieties. So this one is Little Adder behind me. Little Adder is a little bit bigger in the pot than you see in the landscape. In the landscape, one and a half feet, maybe two feet tall in the pot, it is definitely stretched out. And that happens with perennials growing in containers. But once you get it in the garden, you should have a nice, a little bit more compact blue, darker calyxes. So you get like a light blue flower spike, and then you see it's a little bit darker blue as it fades. I'm gonna tell you the bumblebees are all over that little adder variety right now. I do have two kudos varieties here. I have a coral and I have a yellow. Now I wanna tell you, we have a lot of um, growers here, Epitides, our coworkers, that do grow these varieties, but they're not the most dependable as far as hardiness is concerned. So again, if you're gonna grow kudos, make sure that you're protecting them for the winter with the winter mulching, okay? Um, but also, tender perennial, maybe a really good long blooming annual. Sometimes with mild winters, we'll get them to come back. Other times with heavy winters, you won't see them. So just be aware if you enjoy these colors, you might need to really protect this variety. I'm gonna tell you without a doubt, the most award-winning and the most dependable variety is going to be this light blue one back here. This is called Blue Fortune. Blue Fortune, hands down, one of my favorite, absolutely easy care, low maintenance, no issues whatsoever in the garden. And I will tell you, since they're so spiky and upright, I love them in kind of the middle or the back border in the perennial garden or landscape uh, border, shrub border. Um, but I will tell you, never have had an issue with that plant ever. Nothing has touched it. Um, it grows, it comes back every year, it does what it's supposed to do, and it's absolutely fabulous. So keep that one in mind. Blue Fortune is really, really my fave. Um, but I will tell you again, reliable. So out of all the Agastaki, all the beautiful colors, these spiky flowers, what are they good companions with? Think about some other of your pollinator attractants. And so really the native daisies like coneflowers and coreopsis, they are awesome companion plants with. They look absolutely gorgeous with a little bit of silver mound artemisia planted in front as well. So this would be a great compliment, just texture and color as well, um, and also deer resistant. So those would be good companions with this plant. I hope you enjoy your agastaki and have a great day.